Hi there, Pat Croce here, and this is the American Cancer Society's HEALD Community Gathering. HEALD is an acronym for health and energy through active living every day. And it is our intention here at the HEALD Gathering to educate you, inform you, inspire you, and encourage you to live a healthy life, to not suffer, that you may have some pain, but you not, need not suffer. And that's what we're all about here at the Healed Gathering. We bring on experts, we bring on survivors, we bring on specialists who can help you with a variety of little nuggets of information that you may utilize in your day so that you suffer less. And this show is for everyone, not just those diagnosed with cancer or those caregivers that are sharing their love with cancer patients, but everyone. We want everyone to live a healthier life in the present moment. And we do that by first and foremost, bringing you into the present moment with our moment of stillness. So all I ask you to do is rest your awareness, your attention, being aware totally of the sound of this Tibetan bell. It's magical how just placing your attention on the sound of the bell brings you into the moment and you don't fret, you don't angst, you don't worry. That's what it's about, bringing us all into this moment together. And I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing time with us, this ever-present time. And if you went on to ACSHeal.com, American Cancer Society's Heal.com, and you made a donation and you got one of our healed bracelets with that green little bead, that guru bead that brings us in all together. We're all in this together. I thank you. I thank our leadership partners, the 30 individuals who ponied up enough money that the healed research is going on as we speak at the headquarters in Atlanta with 400 patients diagnosed with cancer. And top of the list, I thank 6ABC as our media sponsor, and 6abc.com, where you can see the entire library of our year's worth of gatherings. And thank you. Thank you once again for sharing your time with us. I'm psyched today. We have uh, two Marys. We have a Dr. Marianne Ritchie, and we have a Mary Lucky. And both of them will bring some luck and some riches to your lifestyle. First, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Dr. Ritchie, are you there? I'm here, Pat. Thank you. There we go. And I should say, in all truth, that Dr. Ritchie, I didn't recognize her when she came on, but her husband, Dr. Stu Gordon, a wonderful orthopedic surgeon, is one of my friends from two lives ago when I had sports medicine centers. He was a big supporter and a great friend and someone I, I value. So you got it, Marianne, Dr. Ritchie. I'm going to stay with Dr. Oh, Ritchie. The show. Mar Marianne is much more comfortable for everybody because, Pat, first of all, thank you. And my dear husband, affectionately known as Big Daddy, uh, <laughs> big, big Rib, because he likes barbecue, uh, sends his love and best wishes to you as well. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but he puts a smile. He never, never not had a smile. He, you're absolutely right. And He's my biggest supporter. And I will say that we had a chance to chat before the show started. And we love the story back when he started practicing at Fitzmercy and Taylor Hospital in 1987. And you kindly invited him on your show, your radio show back yeah. then. And um, Stu is uh, an energized bunny like you. <laughs> and he was so excited that I think he got dressed in the dark and he came home and he said, Good thing I was on radio because he had on a blue sock and a green sock or whatever. <laughs> I said, honey, it's because you're left-handed. You need me to dress you in the morning along with the other things. But <laughs> 16 feet. We talked about that too. He's size six. He's a, he said that the um, a cathedral cannot be built on the foundation of an outhouse. So it's good to have size 16s. <laughs> you can see why I love that man. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So 
Dr. Richie, Dr. Marianne Richie is yes. a pioneer. This is, I love pioneers. I love people who take their courage and see something that most people don't see. And so you'll see throughout the course of this interview that Dr. Richie didn't just pioneer one path, but at least three paths. She was the first female mm. gastroenterologist in the Philadelphia area. Is that not correct? Maybe number two and a half. There were there was one woman, that, uh, oddly enough, there was a brilliant uh, GI uh, doctor named Sue Gordon, and then I married Stu Gordon. So their mail used to get mixed up when Stu was a resident, but she was brilliant. But And, and there was a woman at Hahnemann. Um, but um, I think I was the first, one of the first to be, I was the first in the suburbs, but the first who was round the clock practice. They were in a lot of administrative and research roles, but they were certainly, well, we were all pretty circa. But um, when I started at Lankanal, I trained at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And boy, if you want to be humbled, that's 20 stories of cancer patients. There's a floor of acute leukemia. There's a floor of chronic leukemia. There's a floor of just head and neck. And every day I left there, not on chemo, not, you know, needing a wheelchair. I said, I am a lucky girl. And right. I think that's what fueled me to bring it home to Philadelphia. Because at the time, Pat, in the mid to late 80s, the big focus, like now with the pandemic, the big focus then was HIV. It didn't have a name yet. It was called GRID, gay-related gay related infectious diseases. People were terrified of it because we were watching healthy young people disintegrate. So screening for cancer has always been there, but colonoscopy is relatively new. It was about 10 years old, et cetera. So it has evolved um, quickly um, in terms of history, but um, it took a long time to convince people that putting a long scope into your intestine was safe and effective, and, um, but it's here now, and it's, it's the best test that we can talk about as we go along. But to be part of that evolution was very special, really. Why was your practice specifically in the gastroenterology field? Where, how did you get there? That's a good question because I, I, you know, I was on a women's leadership panel the other day, and, and people, people say, how did you, you know, decide you want to be a doctor? When I was a girl and going to, I went to an all girls high school uh, with a hundred students. And then I wanted to go to co-ed college. So with cute boys. So I went to St. Joe's because the year I started was the third year they took girls. It had been all boys like St. Joe, Villanova, LaSalle, all the Catholic boy colleges. And then the Catholic girls college was a Rosemont, Chestnut Hill. So when I started, it was a candy shop. Six boys to one girl, yes. <laughs> then I went to Jefferson, the last medical school in the country to take girls. So then as a student in med school, we, Jeff was the first um, high, uh, academic center to, in the world to have a hand center. I was going to be a hand center. I was going to put t artificial tendons in. That was my big goal. But as a student, you spend time in every field, pediatrics, OB, internal medicine, and when I got to internal medicine, I loved that. And I had a role model who was a GI doctor. That would be a, a completely another show because he was such a special human being. He was, um, his, he lived through war-torn uh, Germany. Who was that? that? Who was that, Marianne? Franz Goldstein. He was a world-class expert in Crohn's disease. But as a student, I, I had one of his patients and he sat down and gave me a mini symposium. And he walked away in his starch coat and I thought, gosh, I want to be just like him. So that's how I got into GI. I, I really think my message to students uh, coming in, in college and med schools, keep your mind open, be like a, a ball in the pinball machine and bounce off this and that idea before you wake up at, when you're six years old and say, I want to be president of the United States or I want to be a neurosurgeon. Keep your palate empty and see what influences come along and see what people, but he was so special, Pat. So then I trained at Sloan Kettering, the cancer center, and I was with really the maven of colon cancer research and um, polyp studies. And that's where, gosh, before I got there, probably in the mid, early to mid seventies, New York was the hub, um, fiber optics and the whole principle of computers. And, you know, we put a scope that's probably tinier than my pinky through the rectum into the intestine. Think about that. The first time it was done in New York, I think it was at Mount Sinai, 
four hours and 26 minutes to get from alpha to omega, to get from the opening to the top of the colon. And the room was filled with surgeons, anesthesiologists, GI doctors, hoping that as this journey uh, proceeded that we didn't perforate. I wasn't there, but it was probably 1972 or 73. So by the time I started my fellowship in the mid eighties, it had really advanced, but now it's, it's so Star Wars, really. That so how long does it take? Let's do, I don't want to jump ship, but you're, you got me intrigued. If it took four hours back in 1973, in 2022, how long does a colonoscopy take? Um, we can do a very thorough, complete exam in under 20 minutes. Wow. With a good preparation. And if somebody has no polyps, it could take longer. And we'll talk about what polyps are. but. Um, we stopped to remove any small growths. Well, let's stay here. This is good. Take us through this journey. We There's no set parameter of questions because I'm just intrigued by, I, I've been on the, the bedside of it, but I've never heard the physician end of it where they talk about exactly what, I, you know, I think what it's are we doing? that yeah. this screening happens. And we'll talk about who should be screened at what age, but give us, give us the procedure. Yes. Um, I actually made a video for Jefferson, um, a virtual uh, trip to the endoscopy unit and talk people through, kind of like when the camera talks to Michael on the office. <laughs> so the camera asked me questions. And um, basically, we could talk about the prep a little bit later, but the sedation is wonderful. You, It's the best rest you'll have um, uh, ever. Is that and, the your medicine? Oh, pardon? Is that the amnesia medicine? Yes. Uh, or it is. It does give you amnesia, yes. But it, it sedates you so that you're completely comfortable. You're snoozy Susie or snoozy Charlie. And uh, you don't feel anything. And the scope um, is very tiny. Your your colon or the, the large intestine is made of muscle. Wait, I have to get to the right spot in the camera. I'm trying to get. Anyway, it's a tunnel this way this way. It's a tunnel made of muscle and it expands and contracts. So if we put a, a small tube in there, you can see how, oh, I'm backwards here. There we go. It can pass through easily and not hurt your intestine. And that's why screening for colon cancer is it's the perfect situation for screening. I'm going to start with the word screening. A screening test is one done to prevent a cancer, for instance. So Primary prevention means we know that cigarettes cause about 20, about 90% of lung cancer cases. Let's take that as an example. So if you avoid cigarettes and secondhand smoke, your chances are pretty good you're not going to get lung cancer. We don't know how to the primary prevention for colon cancer, cancer. Oh. but it's very common. It's often deadly, but very preventable. So how do we screen for it? Well, we look for secondary prevention. What are the patterns we see? We see it in family histories. We see it, the number one risk factor for colon cancer is, what would you guess? Uh, dietary? Age. Oh. Age. And you bring up dietary because they're, say, now we know lunch meat is considered a carcinogen or a cancer-causing agent. So if we're from Philly, you have to have a hoagie once or twice a year, but it's what you do the other 363 days. But the whole point is we watch for trends and we used to see a, a jump in our say mid fifties of cases of colon cancer. So we thought, Ooh, if we are proactive and we start scoping people at age 50, we should stay ahead of the majority of cases. Well, as you mentioned, the screening age this year dropped uh, May 18th of 2021 within the past year to 45 because we've seen a notable rise in cases in people under 50, even under 40. Dr. And Richie, let's wait one second there. Just Let's just take a pause because this is really important. What you're saying is that the new research has proven that everyone, male and female, at the age of 45 should have a colonoscopy, yes. a screening to see, to ensure that there's nothing scary living in within you. Exactly. 45 to stay alive. Oh, that's good. You like that? Yeah. yeah. So the other caveat is that African-Americans 
are 20% more likely to be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And the, the correct term is colorectal. I don't, the large intestine is the loopy part called the colon and the rectum is the straight part at the very end of the large intestine. And when we see cancer in the rectum, it's treated a little differently than colon cancer. So the proper term now is colorectal. I've been saying colon because it's easier to gotcha. say in conversation, but correct term is colorectal. So African Americans, 20% more likely to be diagnosed, 40% more likely to die from Ooh. colorectal cancer. So that's when we said, you know what? Stop it. We have to get everybody to the table by age 45 at the latest. Um, because if you have a family history of colon cancer or colon polyps, even I hear some doctors when they're conversing and say, do you have a history of colon cancer? What about colon polyps? So that when you can talk to your doctor about the exact- For exactly what is a colon polyp? A colon polyp is a tiny growth um, in the lining of the colon. So if you picture your colon as a tunnel, let me get over here, and you have a little dot on the side of the road, as small as my mole, there you go. I put that there for show and tell. If you have a little dot in the middle of a road, I keep going the wrong way here, um, you're not going to feel it. And that's why screening is so important. Now, not all polyps become cancer, but pretty much all cancer starts as a polyp. So no polyp is my friend. Oh, well, let's say that again. Say that again. Not all polyps become cancer. But? But pretty much all cancer starts as a polyp. Mm, that's important. So no polyp left behind. <laughs> that means you shave it off? Um, honestly, the, the technique, the um, technology we have is awesome. We have little tweezers that pinch out small polyps. We have a wire. So picture a mushroom. I'll be a mushroom. And if, if we see a polyp that's a little bigger, we feel very fortunate if it's on a neck or a stalk. And we put a wire around the stalk and we cinch it. And most of the time we could just squeeze the wire and the polyp pops off. Slightly larger, we have cautery attached to that wire and we zap it a little bit and it um, coagulates any blood vessels in the area. But it is, it's a beautiful uh, uh, technique. And so colonoscopy, doesn't alter your colon. We can go in, remove any uh, small growth that we see, or if we see a larger growth, biopsy it and tell if it's benign or cancerous, and then move on from there. Um, so the, the colonoscopy uh, should be done at an earlier age if you have a relative, like a first degree relative means a parent, a brother, sister, or a child. And if they have colon cancer, if a parent, if, you're, if your mom or dad had colon cancer under the age of 60, it means we're going to start scoping you or screening you at age 40. We don't wait till 50 and now age 45. So they're, they're really important things. And know your family history. That could save your life. When you're at Thanksgiving dinner and everybody's gathered, ask your aunts, uncles, do you know the grandparents? All those features uh, are important to know. So Dr. Ritchie, with hereditary causes how do we is there a higher incidence due to heredity that shows that these polyps may be cancerous is that why you you would move the age to 40 yes yeah that you're more likely um depending on how many relatives are affected depending on their ages um and so it's not just colon cancer it's uh polyps are on a timeline in the beginning they're abnormal tissue, but completely benign. But as time goes by, the, the cells become more irregular. We call that dysplastic or uh, more like dys. Don't dys me. That's how I can remember. D Y S. Dysplasia <laughs> means cell growth. So dysplasia means the cells are becoming more and more irregular. And then when they become really normal cells, if you take two cells from your skin, they should be identical. You should be able to uh, superimpose them and you wouldn't be able to see the, the underneath cell. Cells that are slightly irregular, uh, so, so two cells that are normal look like identical twins. Two cells that are slightly different look like fraternal twins. Two cells that look more dysplastic or high-grade dysplasia, that's what we go after, might look like siblings. They're similar, but they're not identical. They're not even fraternal. And then cancer means we look at two cells 
and one's shaped like a triangle, one's shaped like an oval. They don't look like they're from the same family. Mm. So that's kind of a, a visual that I give my patients when I say, how do you know when you look at a biopsy, how do you know the cells? Is that they're all doing their own thing. If, if there's anarchy and all the cells look different, that's cancer. We want to go in and take out polyps before they have a chance to proceed to cancer. Okay, so let's say a colon rectal screening and you have some polyps and they're removed, they're benign, they're small. Does that increase your risk? Do you, do you then move your next colonoscopy or next screening to five years versus 10 or is it? Yes, there's a whole algorithm path that we could go through, but um, the take home message is um, there's a type of polyp called adenoma, depending how many you have at your initial screening test. To, uh, say, let's say a person has no polyps. Hallelujah. I'm so glad I drank the goo. I went through that because people still uh, push back because of the prep. And we should talk about why people don't want to have the screening. But um, if you have absolutely no polyps and no family history that you're aware of, you get the pass for 10 years. But if you have a family history, that might have us call you back at the five-year point, depending on what your relatives had and their age. Or like myself, let's take myself. I had some stomach issues a couple of years ago, and they did the thorough upper GI, lower GI, and they did find three little tiny polyps. Now, whether he removed them or not, I don't know. But now all of a sudden, my next screening is in five years. And it depends because there are a type of polyp called hyperplastic, and they're pretty friendly, depending on how many you have, or an adenoma. And it depends on how many you have and how big or small they are. Mm. So that there's a, a whole beautiful algorithm that was pretty much started when I was a slow cutting with this Dr. Winner where I trained with. So um, after 30 plus years of data, we're able to say uh, initially um, we didn't know whether we had to torture people and say come back in a year or three years or five years, but five years is better. We used to bring people back at a, a, a sooner date but so you fact. say take home the take home messages so far are everyone male or female at the age of 45 should be screened yes two if your screening detects polyps or you have a family history then you move that screening up to 40 years old depending on the the circum the uh details of that family history yes Perfect. And, and the doctor would help you, ref your doctor would know that, right? Your doctor yes. would be a family physician. And and your family history may also determine whether you come back at 10 years, let's say you have no polyps. You, if you have a strong enough family history, we might check on you every five years. And you know what, Pat, the other thing was, um, I think colonoscopy is brilliant to think that we can go in and find and remove precancer. Who wouldn't like that? But there are people who shy away. We can talk about that. But the other choices are do something. The best test is the one that gets done, the best screening test. A stool test. So if you picture, as I was trying to show, your colon is a tunnel. I think we're on reverse here. Um, if Or like picture I-95. If there's a little bump in the road and you drive over it, you're not going to feel it because there are four lanes, right? But if, if there's a boulder in lane three, it's going to narrow, or, or sorry, in lane four, it's going to narrow you to three lanes. And you might feel symptoms if, if you start to be slightly constipated or if you get crampy or belly pain. And you're just fortunate if you have blood show up, if you have a growth right inside the rectum and you evacuate and you're lucky enough to see blood on the toilet paper and there's a red flag, you know, to get checked. But sometimes cancers are higher up. And by the time they trickle blood, you don't see it. So that's why, in other words, blood is food for, can for colon cancer anyway. So a lot of blood vessels feed a colon cancer. So they trickle blood. So the thinking is, as your waist comes through and rubs up against that boulder in lane four, you're going to test the stool for hidden blood. And you say, you sneaky little tumor, I'm going to get you. But... The fit test is very, very good. We could we do that once a year. Let's say somebody is a shy about getting the scope. At least please do the stool test. We it misses about 25% of cancers. It's still better than doing nothing. But it also misses polyps because little polyps aren't big enough to have that blood supply yet. And we want to go in and get the pre-guys. We want to get the pre-cancers and not even make cancer in the same sentence as your name. And then the newer one that you see, the dancing box, 
is so clever. It has testing your stool for hidden blood and for abnormal DNA that you might pick up from the tumor. And together, the, the rate of finding cancer is as high as 92%. It still misses about 8%. And it misses more than half of the polyps that are in there. And because it's more costly, we can only do it every three years. So if it misses, you know, if you're one of the 8% that it misses your cancer or it misses your polyps, we have to wait three years. So the whole point to everybody out there, if you have any kind of symptoms, go to your doctor's stat. I don't care if you're under 50, under 40, go and be examined because it's not normal to have rectal bleeding or prolonged belly pain or unexplained weight loss. There you go. You heard that. Prolonged stomach pain, weight loss, bleeding out of the rectum. Check with your doctor. Don't diagnose yourself or misdiagnose yourself. Uh, and you can see why Dr. Marianne Ritchie has her own radio show, Radio Doctor. Uh, tell us, before we let you sit on the sideline, there's still so much more to talk to you about the blues and the pinks and everything else you're into. But tell us a little bit about how people can listen to your radio show. You're such a great communicator. Thank you, Pat. Um, the Your Radio Doctor, uh, uh, we post all of our shows on yourradiodoctor.com, but it is on WPHT. People can remember PH for Philadelphia, T for Talker, the big talker, uh, every Saturday at 5 o'clock. And each week I interview a physician about medical issues. Uh, uh, this month I had um, two of the superstar world experts on colorectal cancer screening, et cetera. And it's five o'clock on 12, 10 a.m. Or people can listen on the Odyssey app, odyssey.com forward slash listen. But um, it's brought to, it's, uh, we're, this is our third year and um, we have big listenership. And I just, it's my community service. It's my way of saying, how do I prevent osteoporosis? What is it? What are the risk factors? How can I, you know, what do I do to stay ahead of emphysema? And each week we get people from around the country. So thanks for asking about that. Well, now, as we talked about it in the beginning of the show, you being a pioneer as a GI doctor here in the Philadelphia area, one of the first female GI doctors. Uh, tell us, you also pioneered this blue lights campaign. What is that? The, the major buildings in Philadelphia that have the, uh, ability to light up with crown lights or messaging. I called Pico about nine years ago and said, could you share a message with me? I never knew how messages got up there. And they said, what is it? And I said, colonoscopy saves lives. And I said, sure. And I said, this is way too easy. So I went about asking two Liberty Place, one Liberty, BNY, PSFS, Franklin Institute. It goes on and on. And on. I'm trying to say them all so I can thank the Boathouse Row, Ben Franklin Bridge, so then I called the state rep uh, in Philadelphia, Maria Donatucci. I said, can you help me get the Capitol? For five years, the Pennsylvania cap state Capitol blew for the month of March. This year, we got every state Capitol blue. I called the- Seriously? Yeah. Throughout the country? Yes. yes. The US of A. And so um, wear your blue. Uh, because you know what we just said, this, this, cancer. Other screening tests like mammogram pick up early cancer. The new low density um, CAT scans for people who smoke a lot. We're finding early lung cancer. We're just going ahead and screening people. They pick up early cancer. This finds pre-cancer and erases it. We got to get the message out because one in three people over 50, one in two people over 60 have polyps. It's common. Mm. I hope people are listening. Okay, now let's switch from, before I ask you to sit on the bench, let's go from blue, the blue lights campaign, to the pink, the pink plus program. What is that? Very briefly, there has been a historic lag between men and women being screened for colon cancer because women, the pink campaigns have been fantastic since 1982. I think that's when the pink ribbon began. Um, women think mammogram and done. Not all women, but many women think, got my mammogram, got my yearly GYN exam, I'm good. I feel fine from the waist down. It's a man's disease. No, it's about equal in men and women. Um, there's embarrassment. There's uh, all kinds of reasons why women delay. Time is a factor. It's, it's a commitment to take time to do the bowel prep and then have a day where you're sedated and you can't be. We've fixed that because now we could do the prep in a shorter time frame and you're sedated on your colonoscopy day and you go to work the next day. But so for women, I thought, um, and the other really important factor, 
gynecology cancer risks are related to colon cancer risk. If a woman has uterine cancer up to the age of 50 or ovarian all the way to 65, it bumps the risk for colon. Mm. The reverse is true. If a woman has colon cancer under age 40, up go the risk of ovarian and uterine. I don't hear anybody saying that. And we're working with the American College of Gastro and American College of OBGYN to make a joint statement to get out there. I, I shouldn't say I don't hear anybody saying that, but it's been a long time in coming that we reinforce that idea. So we say, listen, Mrs. XYZ, I always ask my patients when they come to see me with this or that GI, when was your last uh, pelvic exam? When was your last mammogram? It's one more person reinforcing that all of these things are important. So pink plus means when you come to the breast center at Jefferson, uh, for a few years, I was bringing a gynecologist. So you could be Dorothy and us. You go to, somebody puts your blue check dress on, somebody puts your ruby slippers on, and somebody puts Toto in the basket. You get your mammogram, your GYN exam, and you talk to me about some screen, whether it's even just a stool test, it's something. And at a time in, when Philadelphia was 44% colon cancer screening, 77% of our women came back for colonoscopy. Wow. It can be done. It's time is the most precious commodity. Yes. Isn't time the most, the thing we have the least control, but that we most want more of. And it's amazing people don't undergo a colonoscopy because they don't like the prep. When the colonoscopy itself is painless, as you say, it's the best rest you can get, you're done. And yeah. then you know that, you know, you get a clean bill of health or there's something that someone is looking out after you where you're not. So why, why is this prep so, there's so much resistance I to think, the prep? Well, because when I started as a fellow in the 80s, the, the, the um, exercise included two and a half days of liquid diet, two and a half days of laxatives and enemas, not fun. Then in the 90s, it was a, I can't see where my hands are. It was a gallon jug plus, it was four liters, and you were supposed to finish that in two hours. Your brain, after you've eaten enough, says you're full. Your brain, when you've had enough to drink and you're hydrated, says, you can stop now. Imagine trying to force yourself to get four liters in when your brain says enough already, but it's meant to be a tidal wave that flushes your bowel out. So now we've went through studies, we realize that if we split the prep and you drink one liter of the potion uh, with a liter of something you like, iced tea or lemonade without pulp, you're still drinking two liters. So if you drink a liter of this uh, special solution that helps you empty and chase it with a liter and wait a four or five hours and do it again, like rinse and repeat on the shampoo bottle. <laughs> it's much kinder, it's more tolerable, and it works better. Because if you're not clear, if the tunnel isn't clear when we look in, we can miss small, it kills the whole mission. We can miss the small polyps we're trying to erase. So just to reemphasize, now the pre-action prior to the colonoscopy is a liter of the special sauce and a liter of Gatorade or whatever, Wait four hours after you've spent most of the day in the bathroom and you re-drink it and you clean it and you clean out what wasn't cleaned out the first time. Correct. It's like power washing the side of your house. The first time <laughs> you get the big chunks off and then the second time it looks crystal clear. A power wash. I say it's like drinking a tsunami actually, which it kind of is. <laughs> it's, like tsunami. it's nature. It makes you feel one with nature. But that's it. That is the only prep work in addition to don't eat or drink anything else. Yes. Uh, but you can you can drink you can drink liquids. And I tell my patients, drink chicken broth or because it's fatty, so it makes you feel full. Wait, 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 wait. So after you've done this rinse out, this tsunami wash. Oh, right. I'm sorry. Afterwards, yes. Afterwards, thank you. Nothing NPO, Latin for nothing part oral, because people come in. Sucking a hard candy or chewing gum. No, because we want your stomach empty. You're going to be sedated. We don't want that fluid to come up, back up and you aspirate, choke, right. die. So yes, nothing past your lips. You can brush your teeth. You can take your pills. If you have a hard pill, blood pressure, take it with a little baby sip about two, at least two hours before. Because if you are chewing gum or sucking on hard candy, you're creating saliva and you're drinking your saliva. So you're filling your stomach and we cancel the case or we delay it. So thank you. I want to stop talking so you can get to know. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mary and Richie. Now just take a seat on the bench. We'll bring yeah. you back.
And we're just going to visit with one of your patients right now, right? My, my dear friend, and I, I referred her to one of my colleagues, yes. Uh, thank you, thank you. And next we're bringing on a, a survivor, one who was diagnosed with cancer and a screening saved her life. Mary Lucky, she was lucky indeed. <laughs> yeah, Mary. Hi, how are you, Pat? <clears throat> we just spent some quality time with your girlfriend, Dr. Marianne. <laughs> and you can see why she has her own radio show. She, she Yep, and, and you should see her at a party. <laughs> she should wow. have her, her own variety show, too. So. Well, she's entertaining. She's yes. informative. She puts yes. everything in pictures so that you yes. understand it. Yes. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Mary. When were you diagnosed? But more importantly, how did the diagnosis come about? Okay, well, uh, it was about a year ago, just about a year ago, and uh, I was all the things that you said you're not supposed to do. I did. I ignored uh, everyone worrying I would not get a colonoscopy. Why not? Uh, and I'm, I'm a coward. Uh, first of all, and no, no, this is important. I want to interrupt here. Why yeah. would you refuse getting a colonoscopy when, in fact, it could help you to detect cancer? Yeah, it's the truth because not only. Are you saying this? Mary Ann said it to me. And actually, the woman who does my radiologist said it to me. She said, you know, she said, if I detect something, you've already had the cancer. This is the one you should definitely get. And I ignored her. Uh, you know, I guess I thought in that like, <laughs> like, I don't know, um, unfairness of life. You know, I, 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 my mother had breast cancer, so I wouldn't get this other kind of cancer and no one in my family had cancer and I felt good and I wasn't overweight and I never smoked. And, uh, and the longer I went and I was, you know, almost 73 when I was diagnosed. So I wasn't, you know, I kept thinking, well, this is really good news because I am, you know, I feel good. I'm healthy. I have a lot of energy. You look great. <laughs> I don't know about that, but you know, I, I do feel that, you know, um, I kind of, I guess was bargaining with God, you know, and saying, you know, well, I'm not going to get this because I've had other, heartbreaks in my life. This is not going to happen to me. And it was just, you know, irrational. And, and I and I was told that by people who I respect and I read the odds, but I did get a checkup and every year I would get a checkup and I would do that disgusting fecal test. And then I even stopped doing that. I'd go to the doctor and he'd give me the package and I'd say, okay, oh, I not do it. And this year I thought I really have to do it or last year. And wait, I did. Let's, let's stop here. Just take a pause. Take I know a you're on a yeah. I want to no, no, this is good. Thank you for the courage. Yeah. I want to set the frame right here. So you, uh, for the first 70 years of your life, you've never had a colonoscopy, the fecal test you didn't want any parts of. Off and on, off and on, right. And so even though your physician recommended it and your friends recommended yes. it, right. Dr. Right. Mary Ritchie being a friend of yours who is a GI specialist and a guru, you right. said, nah, nah, it's not for me. Why would lie? I would say I'm going to do it, and then I wouldn't do it. A lot of people watching this feel the same way, so oh, this yeah. is why it's good. And so what made you do it that that really, truly saved your life? Well, I, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous, Mary. You have to do it. So I, I did the, the, you know, the fecal test, and I sent it in, and he called me right back. And he's a very calm he, – he, he's from California, so he does not speak the way I do around here. Very calm. And he said, oh, you know, Mary, uh, there was blood detected and you have to get to a colonoscopy. And I said, oh, all right, doctor. He said, no, I'm not kidding. And I thought, well, I, I know I'm going to do it. Um, you know, and I think his urgency, you know, you know, frankly freaked me out. And I, so I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know anything about the reading of the test. So I don't know if they can tell something, but I went and I had the colonoscopy. And, um, you know, uh, one thing I have to say to everybody who's afraid, it's not, the prep isn't even as bad as people say. They, they make the prep sound. I mean, I had friends that say, oh, it's horrible. If you don't eat a lot, you know, if you like literally just like stay off heavy food for a few days, it's like not a big deal. So I went in and the colonoscopy, it's exactly what you said. It's nothing at all, but they woke me quickly. And, you know, it's like, like the ad on TV says, you remember when they tell you have cancer. And I remember the nurse had her back to me and uh, she, she didn't want to talk to me and she was a sweet lady. So I just said, I have cancer, don't I? And she shook her head. You know, it does scare you. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But um, so, you know, then from then on, it was, you know, a different passage. You know, <laughs> I, know I get emotional all the time. I get emotional and everything. But, um, you know, and I, I, it saved my life. And I, I realized that. And frankly, the whole previous time was probably worse than the time after that because um, 
Should I continue or do you want to ask please, me something? No, please, I okay. want to know what you mean by the previous time. Well, I mean, I think the fear and the anxiety and the worry actually was worse than having it. I mean, frankly, after I was diagnosed, um, I, I can't tell you how great everybody was. I mean, the doctor I went to at my neighborhood uh, hospital, I, I called him and when he called me and he said, you know, this everything looks good because I had, you know, they give you blood tests and a CAT scan. And then he said, and I said, well, doctor, if this were your mother, because he was young enough to, because I have sons his age. And I said, if this were your mother, what would you do? I said, good question. If it were my doctor, I'd go to a teaching hospital. So then I called Marianne because I knew she was at Jeff and she's teaching hospital. And I said, Marianne, and you know, there's that thing that I grew up with and certain ethnic groups are guilty of this, the Irish Catholics. I mean, you don't want to bother anybody. You don't want to put them out. You don't want to annoy them. So I called her up. I said, Marianne, I'm not sure you care. And boom, she just like leapt right in. And she put me in touch with all these great guys at Jeff. And it was um, another colonoscopy. So I thought that was pretty ironic. Somebody that avoided a colonoscopy for like 72 years, I have to get two within like a week. And uh, so I had another colonoscopy. I had a PET scan, a lot of blood test. And then they brought me into a, a just a terrific GI guy uh, who did the colonoscopy and then another terrific surgeon. And um, I can honestly say I didn't have one ounce of pain from the beginning to the end. I had no practically no recovery. I, I walked out of the hospital. I mean, I, you know, they don't let you walk, but I had no pain. The incisions were like a work of art. Everybody supported me. Marianne kept me in touch with everything. She talked to the doctor. She talked to my husband. She talked to my sister. So it was like really like a cheerleading squad, which was really nice. Everybody, you know, praying for me. Mary, and any other, any other treatment plan besides the surgery? No, it was miraculous you know i mean they first they they say the surgery goes well and then they say that everything looks good you know when the pet scan came back clear that was that was pretty good um and then they then he, when i went back to the surgeon's office he said it was not it was a large tumor in my upper colon wow. and that's why i had virtually no symptoms it was a very large tumor he said you probably had it for a while uh, i had no visible blood no pain no bloating no anything but what Mary, I didn't lose weight. I didn't lose my appetite. I had nothing. I was just walking around feeling great. And uh, it's exactly what Mary Ann said. If it's in the upper colon, you can't see any blood. Um, I couldn't see anything. Uh, even after he told me I had it, like following before the surgery, I couldn't see anything. So it was, you know, pretty remarkable. And he said to me, you're very, very lucky. He said, but you, know, you have, you're, you appear to have like a pretty good immune system. Like my numbers were good on my blood tests and everything. And, you know, I, I actually, the first thing I said to me when they said you have cancer and I said, if I eat one more damn organic blueberry, I'm going to explode. How could I have cancer? I, I, I don't need lunch meat. I knew 25 years ago not to eat lunch meat. So that, I mean, I never eat lunch meat. I don't eat smoked foods. I hardly ever eat bacon, you know, and I, and I, and I got it. So then um, after. You never know. You could have had it worse or something else or it can metastasize everything you were doing with avoiding processed foods and eating the good super berries, that's still good stuff. Yeah, you should see how many I'm eating now. I mean, I'm yes. really I got to apologize. I know how lucky you are, and I was mispronouncing Mary Lux as Mary Lucky. So that's right. I, Don't worry about it. <laughs> this is Mary <laughs> Lucky. If Actually, is, that's a lot closer than most people do. It's, it's really an odd name, and it's my husband's fault. I had a nice, easy name. But anyway, he... Um, so then, then I went to the uh, Dr. Ramirez. I'm going to give him a shout out because he's the only one I talked to and I got permission to say his name. He's such a humble and sweet man. And he's my oncologist. And, uh, and he actually looked embarrassed when I asked if I could say his name. Um, but he told me the good news that I didn't need any treatments. And he explained the whole thing, you know, treatments at a risk, you know, because they compromise your immune system. And he said, it looks like your immune system is pretty good. So we're going to try to fight it on our own. So, so far, so good. It, it literally, it like childbirth was much harder than this. I mean, this was like not, I, I mean, there was no pain. And I, I, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to Marianne. I just, I, I feel like I'm gushing on people, but I, I am. Well, I'm Mary, like, I think Mary, the important part for our listeners is that you had no symptoms. Nothing. And the Screening truly did save your life because the tumor was in your upper colon and it could have done a lot worse. It could have oh metastasized. Your PET scan was negative. But we don't know what the future held if you did not get it diagnosed and treated, extracted. I mean, it's just truly amazing that your, your prime example textbook of 
why screening works. Well, that's what Marianne said, right. She said, because I said, I really don't have much of a story. I mean, it's not like I'm, you know, a crusader or anything. <laughs> she said, I like that too. I'm just not one of them. And I thought, you know, um, it, I was just really lucky. And I had, and I, and, and I, I don't know why, but uh, I, I could kick myself because now, you know, my son, you know, now my no, 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 stop, please. This is the beauty of the past. I'm going to share with you a Zen proverb. The past has served its purpose perfectly. Now you let it go. You let it, you're in the present moment with this great experience that you can share for all of our listeners and viewers that you had cancer. You were walking around symptom free, feeling great with cancer. And you have no idea what would have happened if it wasn't diagnosed via screening. And so that is why the divine universe gave Mary Lutz this right. opportunity to be. So forget about the past. Right now is what it's all about. You are an advocate for listening to your body, listening to those who are in the know, like Dr. Marianne Ritchie, who says we should all be screened at 45. And if you have a family history, your family now yeah. has to be screened at 40. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, and and I I have a sister. Uh, she's actually older than I am, and uh, of course she is like we I, well, She's actually a nun, you know, a Roman Catholic nun, and uh, we always say that you know she has never had one thing wrong with her ever in her health ever. She's seventy seven, uh, and I and I I when I call her I said you know I don't care how healthy you are. She said well I'm not due for another two years. I said get there, and she got in, and she went in immediately, and the doctor said despite her amazing health record. You come back in three years, you know, which no. they, they never said to her before. They said, see you in 10 years. But now she's you know, what kind of what kind of nun is your sister? <laughs> Same show. But she's Same a real show. nice one. She's a really nice one. I just want to give you. Well, I, had, I, had an aunt, <laughs> I had an aunt who was my favorite female on the planet. Sister mm -hmm. Corrine Ritchie. How about that? Dr. No kidding. And, and I loved her. She was a mercy oh. nun and she died of colon rectal cancer. No. Yeah, so let's bring on Dr. Marion Ritchie okay. back. I love you, Ritchie. Oh my gosh, Sister okay. Corrine Ritchie. Wow. I know. Same spelling, Pat? Sorry? Same spelling? Yes, exactly. Yikes. Unbelievable. Exactly. One of the good leaves on the family tray. No, 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 no. You got no. it. And we also have Diana Haight here. Diana is our director. And so this is the time of the gathering. And this has been such so informative and fun that I don't even know how much time we have. We have 10 minutes for questions. So Diana, do you have a question for Dr. Marion Ritchie? Ritchie, we love that Ritchie name. <laughs> or Mary Lux, the lucky one. I do, I do. And as a fellow uh, Irish Catholic who went to all girls school, I understand all of the, what you're saying. <laughs> but Dr. Ritchie, you talked about the fact that people who don't have high risk factors, you know, um, the stool, checking is good enough you know is there a point because age is such a factor that as we get older should it be okay you've been doing regular stool screenings they've all been okay but now you really need to get a colonoscopy is there a time when that becomes an issue well i i think from the the very beginning back in the 80s we did stool tests on everybody walking at from 40 to 50 and then scope at 50 and the those the stool test in the past had false positives. You know, you'd eat a raw hamburger yesterday and the blood would show up in your stool. So that's when they fell out of favor. But the current one has immunochemical testing. So it eliminates animal blood. It's much more specific. So it's a good test. But as you say, you know, even with the combination of um, checking for blood and DNA, if you can't have that one, the more expensive one for three years, and there's a cancer in there, it has three years to set up shopping malls and condos. Why, you know? So if you have a family history, if you're at higher risk um, or if you've had polyps yourself and you've had colonoscopy, say, oh, I'll just do stool tests. We, we kind of don't do them for that. But in general, if we can get up the courage to go through and Mary's story is so beautiful and so perfect because that is the key. She um, told me when we were talking that the biggest reason when she looks back is because friends told her the prep was so awful. And we've even gotten the prep refined enough that you can start drinking at say at 5 a.m. do half, the other half at 9 a.m. and your scope in the afternoon. So you only lose one day on the calendar. But all in all, 
Um, there's no age cutoff to jump from one to the other. As soon as you get up the courage and learn that colonoscopy, unless you have some other medical condition, but for the most part, we can get very, just about everybody through it very safely. So Dr. Ritchie, I think it's important to place such an emphasis on this screening because we talk about breast screening that women can do at home. We talk about prostate screening, whether it's from the doctor or just the blood test, the PSA, but, and we, they seem so simple, but they're so effective here. All you have to do is have a couple shakes in the course of a day and go and go take a nap in this hospital setting. And you can be then free. Well, and then when you wake up, you get gourmet graham crackers, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and apple juice or cranberry juice. It's, the sky's the limit. And it tastes so time. good. But you know what? I was going to say to Pat and Diane and, and um, Mary that one of the things that I always tell people in the public is this may come as a surprise. More people die of colon cancer than breast cancer. It's not a contest. Yeah. But wow. think how many people know that, especially women. Wow. That, that's when we combine men and women together. But it's a men and women. It's a, you, you know, it's a unisex or bisex di disease. It affects everyone. And so it's not a contest. That's why I combine, hey, get your mammogram and have a conversation about some colon testing together. They're all important. But more people comply with the mammo because there's no sedation and no prep and all. But it's... Um, and the other thing, Mary brings up another good point. One of the reasons why people uh, put off thinking the whole yucky process is because I'm, I have no family history. I have no risks. Number one risk factor, age. And when we're seeing it now in a higher percentage in people under 50, under 40, I mean, I have a whole collection of people 30, from 27 to 33 with the kind of polyps, with adenomas, the kind that advance. And they came through for some other reason, thinking they had food poisoning or a little bleeding from hemorrhoids. No, it's out there. So if you have symptoms, see your doctor, tell your doctor, and don't take no for an answer. Beautiful. Yeah. I have a question for Mary. Now that you're through your surgery, everything's good, thankfully. Uh, what is your what, what is your protocol now? How often do you have to go get screened, and and what is that like now at post? post well, I have to get uh, every three months. I get a series of blood tests, and they post them. Uh, uh, am I allowed to say that Jefferson has something online, Mary? And I already said it. So I, I hope I'm allowed to say it. Yes. But Jefferson has a my charts, and you can check the results, which I never do because old habits die hard, and I like to hide my head. Uh, and then we have, I used to go, well, the first couple I went in, but uh, recently uh, Dr. Ramirez has been doing a teleconference and he calls me up and he tells me, but then I have to get a, a colonoscopy once a year and I have to get a CAT scan once a year. And I, I didn't ask him for how long I have to do this because I'm just going to keep, look, I'm no spring chickens. I don't, it's not like I have decades to live. So I figure as long as I have, I'll, I don't know how many years I'm going to be doing it, but, you know, I'll be doing this for a while anyway. But it's, you know, it's, believe me, it's worth it. It's worth it. You know, Mary, I mean, my, Mary, my teleconference was yesterday. Was I it? Have, I have mine every three months as well, my blood work. I have one rogue protein that we keep an eye on. And so uh, mine was just yesterday. My, I'm with Penn, Dr. David Henry. So, yeah, and I just love it. You know what he said, though? Listen to this, ladies. He said <laughs> that my blood work is so good. Forget about the IgM. We got to keep an eye on that. But everything else, my kidneys and liver, that it just shouts cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, the one I, that's the one I worry about because you know every time you go in they say do you smoke I go you know I never smoke and then they always do you drink and I say one glass of sunshine yes I do how much okay. have I have a giant glass of red wine every night and you know Marianne you told me this too so don't deny it she said doctors always double what you say, like if you say you have one, they think in their head, and I would say, and I swear, that's all, I'm not lying, I know you're doubling it, but I do have that every day, and I will tell you, when I was getting my first, my second colonoscopy at Jeff, the nurse turned around and she asked me, you know, they asked me the same questions like 25 times, and they said, you have this, because each one has a, has a different, so the nurse turns around and she said, do you have a glass of wine, and I said, yes, I have a very large glass of red wine every night, and she was a kid, she was like 22, she turned around, and she said, I'm going to start having a glass of red wine every night. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> she thought I was like pretty happy for like somebody going through a colonoscopy and having cancer. But anyway, it was, it, you know, it's each of these things, there is a, a, a growth thing. You do become 
I have shed the fear of cancer. Cancer had such a absolute terror in my in my life, you know. And I'm, I'm I don't want to get it. I'm still afraid of it, but it's not that you know the word that shall never be spoken, which is how my mother looked at it. She never. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know how you people felt about that, but I grew up never speaking of cancer. You know, it was just like something you never talked about. Anyway. Yep. Thank you for sharing your diagnosis and treatment plan. Uh, Dr. Marion Ritchie, before we go, would you please share with us some take homes? Give us your bullets. Yes, thank you. Um, the new screening age for everyone is age 45. Don't delay being screened because you don't have risk factors. Number one risk factor is age. Um, and you can't pick your genes. Family history is a very important risk factor. No uh, family members have had colon cancer or colon polyps, how many, get that information. Um, it could determine if you start at an earlier age and if you have a normal exam, how often you come back. And lastly, you can't pick your genes. There are things we can control. Smoking, you got to be crazy. Alcohol is good. I'm Irish too, Mary. Um, but the American Cancer Society, yay. And I want to tell people, and uh, um, I'm not- We have to make this quick, Dr. Ritchie. I got to close. Okay. Maximum two drinks a day for men, maximum one a day for women. It can, if you control those things, it can decrease your risk for all, by 27 to 50%. Now, take that home, everyone. Take it home, get screened. Thank you, Dr. Marianne Ritchie. Go to her show, Your Doctor Radio. Check her out. Mary Lux, thank you for sharing your diagnosis and your treatment path and, and the courage to come on today. Dinah Haight, <laughs> we love you as always. Uh, please, everyone, we look forward to seeing you on May 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time for our next American Cancer Society's Healed Gathering. We, that will be our next live one. This ends our live ones after our first year. But until then, go to 6abc.com or acshealed.com, where we will be sharing highlights from our favorite gatherings over the past year and several special guest short interviews, new interviews. So join us, 6abc.com or acshealed.com. We end every gathering, Dr. Richie and Mary Lux, with a prayer, a simple attitude of gratitude. Thank you for the grace and allow me to welcome what is happening right now, bringing it right back into the now. Thank you all for joining us. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Diana. Mary. Bye. Bye.